Welcome back everyone to SuperCloud 6 live in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and Rob Strecher here to close out our SuperCloud 6 AI Innovators Live program. What's going to follow is our ecosystem speaks portion where we solicit input from all the stakeholders and leaders in our industry. They are AI innovators as well as many more who will be coming on as an addendum on September 19th. There's so much demand for AI innovation that we're going to have another segment on the 19th. We'll plug that in to the site. So always check back to the site. We've got some really big names on that one. Uh, Dave, Rob, great to see you. Rob, good to see you. Hey, welcome, Rob. welcome to California. Oh, thank you. And uh, I know you did a lot of the interviews on the ecosystem speak as well as you got KubeCon next week um, and CNCF. A lot of cloud native discussions around how a new teams are forming around platform engineering, DevSecOps, MLOps, DevRel, throw in a little bit of data science in there and data engineering, all kinds of, like a new, these new SWAT teams. Yeah, I, I think again, your, your talk about personas earlier on in, in the day and how that's going to change. And uh, we actually did a, a KubeCon, or a KubeCon, as I I'm, keep being told I pronounce it wrong. Kube, 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 I always Kube, say KubeCon. No, we're the Cube, we're the Cube. Yeah, I always say yeah, KubeCon, but is it KubeCon it, it's or Kube, Kube, Kubernetes. It's KubeCon. KubeCon. It's KubeCon. But okay. it, yeah. what's funny about it was that uh, a lot of the discussion is going to be about ML flow and things that are in Kube, Kube flow, which is coming out and having its kind of coming out party this year. Last year when we were over there, really there wasn't a lot of AI talk. But I think what's interesting going into some of the you know, discussions that I had that are about to go and play is really that there's a lot going on in this ecosystem and there's a lot around security, how you manage it and what the, the stack is going to look like. And some observability stuff that is, is that as well. You and Stu talked about this a little bit. Yeah. It seems to be a need. You know, we've been talking, we were talking about that at dinner extensively last night, yeah. you know, all these piece parts and it just gets more and more complicated and so application performance, application availability, it well, all fits together. And I, and I think some of the discussions, I've even had briefings that were not in that, that I'm actually doing, finishing my write up uh, that goes along with the video, really talking about platforms for observability and observability, you know, Open Search, for instance, which is the offshoot of Elastic, and when it was forked, when the uh, licensing changed, you see that actually people are building real platforms on top of Open Search, yep, yep. but it's not about just the searchability parts of it. You know, what's interesting, Matt Hull was on from NVIDIA, the VP of AI Solutions, with uh, Barris, uh, who's the head of product at Snowflake of AI, Howie Shu held that panel just earlier. You know, he, one observation he made, and I want to get your reaction to this, because this comes back down to observability and this new end-to-end -end systems that are being developed for AI. Matt Hall from NVIDIA said, you go back a few years ago, there was only one, a few use cases for NVIDIA and for AI that they were applying to. Now with generative AI, they're all over the place. So what's happened is the use cases of, of AI, obviously this is from NVIDIA's perspective, it's gotten massive, the aperture's huge. With KubeCon and, Kube, and that community of Kubernetes and cloud native, AI has opened up um, huge aperture for changing the definition of observability, increasing the role of cloud native DevSecOps operators who are now running with the data engineering platform folks. They seem to be driving the change, Rob, and I'm gonna be curious coming out from Paris and into the North America show for CNCF, how that accelerates, because if this continues like NVIDIA, you'll see the CNCF community probably take charge of the generative AI, because as we've been saying, the democratization of the data side, Dave, is not going to be by the data scientists, it's going to be by the AI itself. So yeah. the role of the humans, there'll still be data engineering, but the bulk of the work is going to be scaling from the hyperscale side, which is cloud native. We heard that from um, our last guest who was saying the science and tech is going to move. So I'd love to get your thoughts and reaction to that because NVIDIA is like, hey, of course, the use cases are massive. So CNCF, yeah. the Kubernetes could explode. Yeah, I, well, I think it's the cloud native aspect, the cloud native con part of KubeCon is that it's cloud native con as well. And I think the name should almost flip flop at this point because mm -hmm. Kubernetes is, I, I know, it's overstating that it's been solved, but it is. It's the services that go around it, and a lot of it is there to support these modern data apps that are there. Like you have uh, DOC, D-O-K, which is data on Kubernetes, which is a big push yeah. that they've had over the last year, and I've been attending those. Well, well. and, and the, the, I just want to follow up on the Howie panel with, with NVIDIA and Snowflake. It's like, you know, we, 
we get so nuanced sometimes in this industry. We analyze and hyperanalyze, but it really comes down to, you know, Moore's Law is dead, but it's alive and well, a million times performance yeah. improvement <laughs> by the end of the decade, and it's all about the data, which is kind of snowflake, bring the AI to the data. So that was a great panel, and, and I think those are two companies. Well, it's that clear, it's clear that, I mean, NVIDIA is the obvious example, yeah. but that point sticks because what everyone's been scratching their head is, is Kubernetes and KubeCon getting too boring? We don't really need a show for it, but as you pointed out, cloud native con, cloud native growth, which is basically DevSecOps, is DevRail, is rocking and rolling. Yeah. It's booming. It's not and like it's slowing down at, at all. So, it's, so Kubernetes is getting boring and becoming standard. You don't need a show for that. It's yeah. already kind of done. Yeah, and the platform engineering, to your point, about how they all come together and how that is the new IT, I think, and it, again, going back to that discussion, the one thing, and you, you brought up, uh, you know, the power law of distribution of Gen AI, and as you go out on that long tail, really, that's the edge. And you talk about things like MicroShift and other smaller Kubernetes deployments and containers out at the edge, where the data really doesn't make sense to bring it all back and doing inference out there and then bringing summarization back, I think that's going to be yeah. a big story. I, I mean, Tesla is a great example, right? And you know, they're talking about how they're sort of rewriting their code, et cetera. But I mean, basically, you know, they're not doing all that stuff in the cloud, they're doing it real time. They take maybe, I don't know, 1% of their data, maybe 5% or less, and send it back to the cloud. Deer runs across, you know, yeah. and that's where the, the inference is happening. It's interesting, a lot of people are talking about, well, you don't need a lot of, you know, you don't need GPUs to do inferencing. Vikram was here today, who knows this stuff. He's deep, deep into it. He goes, oh really? He goes, the math to do like inferencing properly is so complicated, you're actually going to need GP GPUs there. So that's his premise. It's going to be interesting to have him back and you know, dig into that. We don't have time yeah, to get him we, on. Well, we'll get into that, but back to the cloud native. I remember the slide we put up on our opening segment. I don't know if we have it, the ETR first slide. slide yeah, slide one. one. Let's pull up slide one from that ETR if you have it. Rob, if you look at this, okay, Dave pointed out that the MLAI, which is essentially the Gen AI piece, the red line there is showing you where that, what's below the line is kind of what's, I won't say it's going out of style, but it's really more of the on deck circle. Well, let me say will. this. So, so in, prior to, like, during the pandemic, MLAI, containers, cloud, and RPA were all well above that 40% line. And now it's just uh, AI is. Well, oh, but it's hovering around, but, but that's yeah. the, that was the constellation of what cloud native we were just talking about. So uh, container <laughs> orchestration, container platforms, cloud computing, that is, the, that is going to be massively pulled up with Gen AI. And then everything under that line is going to pull up too, because it's the rising tide of Gen AI is going to, yeah. again, open up the use cases, video conferencing. You look at all the labels in there. I know they're categoricals, but all industries will be disrupted. And I think that's why it's kind of the lull before the storm. Yeah. Right? Well, the it's point like, too is, is prior to ChatGPT, it's like, okay, we're doing, we have these you know, side projects with ML and AI. To your point, John, it's going to be AI in infrastructure, AI in software, AI in everywhere. AI and and cloud, by the way, this but, is survey data. This is directly from customers and their, their, their buyer behavior. It also matches with the cube research data that we have as well. So the, the combination of that data really kind of validates yeah. that. Yeah, and I, I think what's interesting is as we see AI ML going up, you see that container orchestration, which is basically cloud orchestration right. rising. And I think that that makes sense because there is no easy button for doing AI ML. And we've been hearing that all day today. And you'll hear it again with uh, Craig Wiley from Databricks. Uh, we actually had Enrico, Enrique uh, Lazaro, uh, Lazaso, get his name right, from uh, Multiverse. Multiverse Computing, where he's talking about quantum techniques being joined with AI. And it's not quantum computing, as you would say, the big machines and things like that. It's actually the techniques. And what it does is summarize and make it more efficient so it can run on a, on a CPU or something of that nature. It's so, so super interesting to stay tuned to because there's a lot of information that comes through. And then we talked to the CISO, uh, Paul Hawkins from uh, Cypher Stash, where how do you actually you know, protect the data? How do you actually make sure it's encrypted everywhere it needs to be as you're starting to get things that are pulled in and make sure that things that shouldn't be pulled into AI aren't. And I, I think that starts to give you that tenor to it's really difficult stuff and By the way, those, it's complicated. And those videos are coming up right on, after this yeah. close on our ecosystem speak. I talked to Andrew Joyner from, um, he's the CEO of HyperScience. They're doing stuff with computer vision that can scan all kinds of contracts as unstructured data and get that into, into, into vector embeds, which is incredible. And then Arana Khanna is the co-founder of Achera. They're offering 
cloud insurance for that basically saying, I'll guarantee GPU, and if I don't deliver, I'll pay for it. So, <laughs> so you know, think flood insurance. Guarantee GPU capacity. So no, this is, this is a resource issue. So yep. spend is not cost optimization. It's essentially like flood insurance. Like if you have critical infrastructure and you need to run GPUs and compute, these guys will insure that. So it's better than buying spot instances. This is like guaranteeing. So you're starting to see the FinTech side of it go from cost optimization, Rob, to like real business model. And, they, and they, they're killing it. They're going to do another round of funding. They get term sheets and everything. So you're starting to see that startup. Um, also earlier this morning, I want to get your reaction to this, Rob, too. We had the CEO of Rockset on, Venkat and Kyle Weller, head of product of One House. Yep. Um, I don't know if you heard that, but it was right up your wheelhouse from, from our Databricks event. Yes. They were talking about the data lake and some of those dynamics, they're seeing the same systems end-to-end -end architecture. That's not a one vendor thing right. that's going on. So you start to see a potential sign that maybe the market and products aren't fitting from the old vendors. Yeah. So this is going to be a very interesting thing. Now, what's your reaction to that as you see these new startups with the new models, new business models and new systems models? I, I think it's a, it's, there's, I think going to be a plethora of ways to address, especially on the data side. I think it's going to expand and then it's going to contract like every other one that we've been seeing. I think to your point on observability, we've seen it expand massively in the observability space and actually start to contract into platforms. I think that's similarly will happen mm -hmm. with people building things that look like new startups into features of existing data platforms. But I don't think anybody wants to be wed to one data platform. I, I think we, we had Raj Verma vehemently say on theCUBE here, yeah. vector only databases is a fail. Yeah. That will not ha be sustainable. Which we've been saying for a while. It's a feature, yeah. not a company, but there are companies out there, we V8, um, Well, we use others. one. Milvis, <laughs> Pinecone. <laughs> we, um, we use a standalone vector database because that's what was available at the time. You know, Mongo's feature w wasn't even available when we, when we launched the Cube AI. But I also want to point out just two other guests this morning, the two practitioners that we highlighted, uh, Uber and Walmart. Uber, Uday is just amazing. Basically, they built this application. They started, they built, started building a platform in 2015, and now and they've always been using AI, but they're injecting AI throughout the entire stack, throughout the entire life cycle. And the interesting thing there was they're able to add new businesses. Think about Uber Eats. They're also be, be, contemplating and actually making moves toward taking their platform and going to logistics companies and say, don't write your own app, use our app. You know, we have it all together, people, places, and things. Well, I thought, I thought so, about it, it, it registered with me of having rented a car this week, going, okay, well, wouldn't it be easier if I could do that through the app in the instant when I go into the airport versus having to go and figure it out, you know, a week in advance or something of that nature, or do it a week in advance. Mm -hmm. But they have all of that logistics, like you said, part for fleet management, which yeah. was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other was Walmart, who basically took their triplet model, yeah. which is their super cloud, and then they developed an AI ML layer, abstraction layer on top of that. And they're serving both the retail side of the organization, kind of like um, Amazon Rufus, which is like a shopping assistant, so that's for the retail side, but also for AI ops, network ops, squeezing value out of the network, uh, better security, using, using machine intelligence to make better infrastructure. So both sides of that from a platform engineering standpoint, helping the, the users shop better and helping the infrastructure run better. It actually, it reminded me of something like Bedrock at AWS where it's a service out to the various different parts of Walmart and they're really focusing in on, from IT ops all the way to supply chain, which was it, really it, interesting. Yeah, and it's highly tuned and purpose built for their environment, which they're so, they have such scale, they can afford to yeah. do that. You know, not every company can, yeah. but it's governed and it, it's, it, it, it adheres to all the edicts of their organization. It's actually quite remarkable what they've done in, in, in less than a year, basically eight months they pulled this off. Okay, so let me, let's get down to the closing kind of like wrap up here, Dave and Rob, and I'll share my thoughts. I'll go, you, get, go to you guys first. The AI innovators are out there. We're documenting them here. We're going to addendum on the 19th. Howie and I are going to do some more, uh, more interviews to add to the program. What does an AI innovator look like? What did you learn from today's um, show uh, all day live? And 
what did we glean out of this? What was the learnings? Dave, we'll start with you. What was the takeaway today? I mean, we had great representation yep. from startup founders, Series A going for Series B, Series C going for D, pre-public, public companies, VCs, and again, a lot of these innovators, what did you learn? I think it's playing out the way, frankly, we thought about it. it was last year was a lot of excitement, a lot of experimentation. And I think, I think we've said the second half of this year is really when you're going to start to see return on some of these investments. And I think it's throughout the stack. We had a lot of discussion today, both online and offline, about the silicon level. Of course, we're setting up for GTC next week. Uh, but, you know, NVIDIA, we've got, you know, got companies like Grok going after the very low latency piece of the market. But NVIDIA's got a really, I think, strong moat. Others are going to come in, but it's really going to be kind of NVIDIA's world for a while. And then as you move up the stack, you know, the data platforms piece, the big takeaways for me are there's still huge gaps in the data estates and the data strategies and, and companies are filling those gaps, but there's, there's, there's a long way to go, which says to me there's a lot of room for innovation and that's going to come from a couple of places. One, existing platforms like Snowflake and Databricks, I would include Oracle, you know, Single Store, et cetera, all these existing platforms that are evolving to catch the AI wave. And then you have all these new startups coming in saying, hey, we're going to be laser focused on solving these problems and filling these gaps, bringing together you know, unified metadata and, and unified governance, and either they're going to hit escape velocity or they're going to get acquired or they're going to be a niche. So those Rob, are my big yeah. takeaways from today. Rob, what did you, what's your yeah. learnings? I, I think the, the evolving personas and how the evolving use cases for AI it really you know, spoke out this morning about how they're looking about it in their products so embedding the AI in the products as well as using kind of the models to fix the models kind of discussion. Yeah. And then looking beyond that, so how do they make it easy for other organizations that are not at the top of the pyramid to actually adopt AI? That's great, Good. and I, had, I totally agree with you. One of the big things that jumped out at me that was an epiphany for me this time was, and just, just as clear as day now, it's, the fog is lifted, is I believe that the market of the customers are ahead of the vendors in the sense of they're forced to start thinking about ways to recast their IT and or their groups in ways to create AI systems. And uh, we've been saying on theCUBE since supercomputing and recently at MWC that the systems revolution's coming. And of course Broadcom's president loved it because they're doing systems. And so does NVIDIA because they're validating and Jensen Wong last week at Stanford essentially validated that concept as well as the power law. So those things I kind of felt good about, but today the wake up call to me was that the customers are moving faster with this experimentation phase to set up new teams where it's not an easy sales motion to say, oh, that's the persona, let's go to market and sell something to that person because it's not a person, it's a team and it's developer led and it's cloud native, maybe not CDO specific, Dave. So it's interesting to see how maybe Gen AI is pulling the, 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 the power away from the CDO, chief data officer and the data players potentially into the DevSecOps because you know, the data states, although they're established, become the crown jewels for Gen AI. So, but that's not going to happen until the software actually runs <laughs> on the infrastructure. No. And Solomon just said, you know, developers won't put stuff into production because they're afraid uh, for the risks. So I think there's a very much a reality that top people are being assembled in the top companies. And I just don't see how the vendors are organized to actually motion to that uh, sale. And I think that's going to be, cause a lot of like probably sales disruptions in the market for these big vendors, but also it's going to set the table for the next gen, next wave. I think you're bringing up a really important point. And we always talk about how every soft, every company is a software company and, and it's kind of become a, a bromide that we repeat a lot, but actually that's been true now for a decade. And what's happening is the, the, the expertise within companies to your point is now at a critical mass where they can lead. And the other key point is, it's, you've said this many, many times, it's the data that's going to determine the differentiation and the IP value. And, and the, these organizations know their data within their industries better than any vendor. And so they're dragging them along. They are ahead of the game because they understand 
the edicts, the, the, the sovereign requirements, the legal requirements, yeah. and they are dictating to the vendors. I mean, you know, the customer's always right, the customer's always in charge, but from an innovation standpoint, they're actually, yeah. many, many of these existing customers are leading, not from the standpoint of developing large language models, there's a few companies doing that, but it's really setting the protocol for how AI is going to well, get Well, there's, there's specific technical issues. So Ray, Raj Varma was talking about some of the things around single store and they're doing with how they've taken MemSQL. We had Chandra from the CMO of Neo4j, former Google uh, engineer. Uh, we had Uday from Uber. They built their own data store with using Spanner and their own systems. So, okay, all of these things, you got Vencat from Rockset, Kyle from uh, OneHouse, you got Databricks and Snowflake. All these companies are doing things that are, that are, are key to in an integrated system. All of that being said, the number one momentum on the, the data that we're seeing is, is, the, is SQL Server from Microsoft, is the hottest selling product in the survey data. So yeah. you have a market where everyone's got Microsoft SQL Server, which I wouldn't even classify as an AI innovator at all. And so- well, it's not. Well, I mean, so it's if, like, if, you, if you talk yeah. to the people who, all of the different names, by every different name, they say that anything in Azure is Microsoft SQL under the hood to a certain extent. But I, I think peop, there's so much of it out there. And this goes back to those, uh, you know, again, you have these data estates of all of this IP these companies have, and they've had SQL for so many years. Yeah. And there's so much rich data in there. The question is, will the disruption enablement that comes from the Gen AI movement, if this new systems revolution happens, it has to disrupt SQL, as Raj pointed out, you have to up, it's not distributed. And yep. so you have a big elephant in the room right there in this incumbent uh, system. And, and you know, you get knowledge graphs coming, you got Gen AI. So the question is going to be, Truly is it a disruptive enabler? And then how is that disrupted? Or does, does SQL adapt? But the, but the fact is that much of this stuff is not distributed. You know, the blockchain's distributed and that's slow. Yeah. So, so <laughs> there's still some real serious challenges around, you know, do I optimize? You heard, uh, you heard Uday say, we're basically optimizing for availability. We can't ever have the system go down versus you know, making sure that the, the, the estimate of when the car is going to arrive is perfectly accurate. Why would we optimize on that and sacrifice availability? So, so that's, you know, and, but my point being, John, they've built a truly distributed app and it was really, really hard and it took thousands of engineers and person days and months and years to do that. And so I think that's why I was saying earlier, I think there are still a lot of gaps to be solved. And I'm curious as to who's going to solve it. Is, is there's got to be, to your, Point, you always make this point to scale. It's got to be a horizontal layer that people can absorb and then build platforms on top the of. The data's got to be available. And, and yeah. but that, the, the distributed platform really isn't there today. Is it the cloud? You know, is it, is well, it distributed, AI? Distributed computing is here. So the question it, it, is, it is, does but the it database doesn't have really to work that well. <laughs> well, well <laughs> or, or, or you look at what Walmart is doing where they yes. have a sidecar of, that's right. a, a horizontal sidecar of AI that's plugging into all kinds of different applications. And what they're doing is instead of embedding AI or building AI apps, multiple different AI apps that scale horizontally, they're looking at an AI layer that then plugs into all of their different apps and enables it, sort of like a co-pilot model. So I think it becomes a, do you build everything off of one platform or do you build a whole lot of co-pilot type? But with platform? open source now, right, these companies like Walmart, like Uber, are able to, to, to lead. And you know, we all know CIOs used to be scared to death of open source and now they, their first question is, is what's the open source you know, alternative that yeah. we can use besides you know, this proprietary solution? But you can use open source, it might be less expensive running a different kind of cluster or system or device, but you still have to host it. Sure, no, so, I understand yeah. that, but I, but I think the point is that's what, you, you've always made this point, you're going to agree, of course, is that's where the innovation is. You know, Charlie Kawas is <laughs> open always wins, it does eventually. And so, but people are leading with open, point being they can now develop on top of that. So I guess what I'm saying is, that distributed system, whatever that looks like, a lot of that innovation is going to come from yeah. customers. Yeah, I think the developers will, will reign. We had um, Alyssa Visnik, she's the CEO, co-founder of Y Labs on earlier. Yep. Um, I like her point because she's like, they have to enable a bottoms up developer, go to market, like a very much a data dog or a Mongo where you give developers the, the candy up and so let them grow into it. But they can't just do that because they have to talk to the enterprise motion because the data that they want to show is in these systems 
that they have to get the crown jewels of, and also they have to protect it. So you have this, I want to build the bottoms up developer motion, but they still have to invest in the expensive top-down sales motion to go to the enterprise, because in order to show the ROI, they got to get the, the generative value out of the data of which the, that's where the crown jewels are for the company. So you're starting to get into a world where you're starting to see that. You don't, you don't see that very often when you got to go bottoms up and go after the crown jewels. And anytime that happens, security's number one, who's got access? So Solomon's right, you know, unless it's not in production, if it's in production, it's got to be bulletproof. You can't let these LLMs get the crown jewels. So you know, clearly a lot of nuanced points. Rob, I know KubeCon's coming up, you'll see a lot of that, but clearly the infrastructure action is at probably the all-time high day I've seen. It's, it's moving very fast um, and the developer appetite is super high and we'll see how it kind of plays out. I mean, I think the, the pressure point at this point is the infrastructure, not so much uh, software or the apps. Well, um... You know, back to developers. You guys, yeah. next week, are going to be at, at KubeCon. Yeah. Um, that's going to be exciting. In Paris, of all places, you and Savannah. And, and Dustin Kirkland. Dustin Kirkland yep. are going to be there. Uh, John and I got to be back here. We're going to go to GTC. We got a Broadcom meeting as well that we're yep. going to go to, the financial analyst meeting. So it's going to be a big week. Yeah, and then we got RSA coming up. We got a bunch of big shows. The Cube is kicking up. Looks like the events are going to be back. Looks like we had a little bit of break in January. Um, we got SuperCloud 7 coming. In July, that's going to be about the sixth data platform or, or this new modern platform we kind of teased out here with Uber and others. Uh, and on the 19th, we're going to have another special addendum to this event, SuperCloud 6, uh, addendum for AI innovators. We're going to have Langchain in, Llama Index, a bunch of panels. Howie Shu and myself will be here bringing you more startups, mostly founders. We'll try to bring in some big companies, but really the AI in is making it happen, enabling this next gen, uh, next generation AI system happen and uh, we'll be covering for you. And so now stay tuned for the Ecosystem Speak, a series of interviews from experts and leaders from the Cube community. Watch this now, thanks for watching and that's it for SuperCloud 6.